So I need to go ahead and pre-record an episode, and I have plenty of material from Ngazi's interview that I think I will start with soon. But for now, I'm going to record this. How about that? Because, <laughs> look, I don't even know if y'all know what time it is. I don't think y'all can see that, but it is 6.28 in the evening, and it is 75 degrees in here. Um, Now, yes, it was rainy today, so it would have been cooler anyways, but anyways... I have AC in my studio. What does that mean? I too wonder the same thing. It means I can finally keep my life separated. No more dragging all this shooting equipment from the house to the studio and the studio to the house <laughs> when it's hot outside and I need to do interviews or Zoom rehearsals. Now I can do everything from the comfort of the studio. Isn't that amazing? Also, guess what I found? This mouse. So you may have noticed me scrolling over here, but now I'm just zooming over here. Watch this hand now. It's late afternoon and I am sitting here doing things like recording comfortably. Which means I am also excited for where this next chapter will take us. Later this week, I will record an interview with Eddie as well as recording an interview with my neighbors, hopefully two interviews. I am just excited, y'all. Monday was a crazy busy day. Which didn't seem like it would be when I woke up and I slept in until 8.30. Isn't that crazy? I know. Um, I found out at 9.30 that Dexter, my AC guy, thank you so much, Dexter. Like, I found out at 9.30 that Dexter would be coming over. Now, I had a couple of errands to run before he got here and I needed to take my show. So yesterday I taped a very short episode. Then... I got back and before I could even settle into editing, I get a call and I need to go over to the shop to help out. There was a big order and we're grateful for every big order that comes through. Yesterday though, it seemed to be the day so many soul crying, soul crying out things were answered. I had an incredibly filling weekend of connecting and great conversation. I mean, I still feel like I'm riding a high, and I wondered yesterday what planet left retrograde because I'm feeling good. Like Nina Simone singing, I'm feeling good. So you know that's gotta be good, because she said, God damn, Mississippi. So, yeah. Who wants to be interviewed? Come into... Just kidding. Not putting it out there for everyone. Um, because of COVID. Anyways. I don't know how to pivot this, but I do think I want to start this, this discussion, though, and I don't really know how, but I'm going to find my way through it. You see, if you don't have any friends on the other side of the aisle on your social media, you may not know that, for whatever reasons, child trafficking is just blowing up. And Ngazi and I had a chat about this off-camera of, why now? And I was angry for a second because now this is a big issue when it's always been a big issue. But it doesn't matter when you come to the party. The fact is you came and you care. Yay! Because the thing is, anything that endangers children is of paramount concern. And I've seen some people who have taken steps to become certified to recognize signs of trafficking. And given what their children are involved in, it makes sense. There is a higher risk. There are risks inherent to all children. And all children deserve to feel loved, safe, and secure. Now, whether that means protecting them from being trafficked, locked up in cages, or being made to feel as though they do not belong at home. All children deserve to be protected. It, I think it's why in doing the play that I'm doing right now and rehearsing for the Larry Project is that he may have been of age, but he was still a child, and we are also somebody's children, and Matthew Shepard deserved more but that's getting away from topic. How about this? Let's read some statistics, how, shall we? African American and Latino youth are overrepresented in child sex trafficking cases. According to the FBI, 52% of all juvenile arrests for commercial sex acts are African American children. Studies consistently report that 50 to 90% of child sex trafficking victims have been involved in the child welfare system.
Instability creates opportunities for traffickers to reach out and bond with vulnerable children. These relationships are then used against the child to initiate sexual activity. Domestic data is limited. When refugees and migrants find themselves in a hostile country, their likelihood of seeking legal support to protect their children is less likely. Looking internationally, 76% of refugees surveyed in the Mediterranean indicate that they have been trafficked or exploited. 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBTQ youth, although they are 7% of the population. A New York City study estimated that more than one in four homeless LGBTQ children and nearly half of gay or bisexual boys are CSEC victims. Homelessness is a clear risk factor that increases the chances of exploitation. A study conducted by the Covenant House in New York City, a shelter and service provider for youth, found that one-fifth of the homeless youth they surveyed in the U.S. and Canada were victims of human trafficking. In 2018, an estimated one out of seven endangered runaways reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children were likely child sex trafficking victims. A big question I had this weekend, well, both Ngazi and I had, were why were children running away from home? Running away from home puts them at a high risk of being exploited. Why do they not feel safe? And there are multiple answers to that question that we'll have to get into in later episodes. I'm going to try and refrain from political commentary, but the fact remains, the risk factors that go into putting children at risk of sex trafficking and endangerment are related to being in the child welfare system, race, immigration, and being LGBTQ youth. Now, as for the child welfare system, as I can attest from friends in it, is that there are just not enough resources being put into that. Here's the thing. It's flashier to think of Hollywood sex rings and other nefarious means, but what re always scares me more is the banality of evil. We can reduce the risk of child endangerment by a better social support system. And this comes from this comes with all of us using government for what it can do best, taking, to an, taking into account its citizens' needs and acting accordingly. <sighs> Too often our policies are punitive versus rehabilitative. Spain has done this. Portugal and Spain have used compassion and rehabilitation model to great success in fighting drug use. The Netherlands and other countries have decriminalized sex work so that those who work in these fields have better access to health care and safety. Both of these help to reduce the endangerment of children by reducing the risk around those activities. We have the chance to do something about these issues and they are all interconnected. And it starts with compassion instead of punishment for the victims and punishment instead of real, and punishment instead for the real perpetrators. Here's the thing, desperate people do desperate things. I'm not talking about the perpetrators, talking about victims and those that situation that lead to exploitation. I honestly have no room to judge what anyone has had to do to survive. Just to see it, the courts decided not to punish a minor who killed her pimp slash John and finally released her from prison. That is probably one of many of countless stories. But if we're going to talk about ending child sex trafficking, we have to talk about the bigger issues at play that lead to child endangerment. I'm grateful for others joining the fight and the conversation, but we do need to have a larger conversation about how so many of these things, race, social, safety net, immigration, being LGBTQ youth, all of these issues that go into putting children at risk, we can focus on saving them. And I'm going to go and say this. I'm talking to the other side of the aisle. We've got to focus on these issues, these social issues. There are bigger things than abortion. I'm going to step off my soapbox now. And also add as a caveat that anger, as my friend Ngazi taught me earlier this weekend, and I'm excited to share our conversations, is neither good nor bad. We don't have good or bad emotions. Now, how we react and take action can be judged, but our emotions that spur us to make change and can hopefully spur us to make something right, those emotions themselves are neither good nor bad. At first, my emotion was anger at the indignation of some friends and how they were framing the issue of child sex trafficking. And part of this indignation on my part comes from the fact that my mother and my partner are both victims of child sexual abuse. Sexual abuse as children. But really, here's the thing. If the goal is to increase awareness and increase education about these issues, how can I effectively say 
welcome to the fight, here's what you can do, instead of saying, why are you just now caring about this? Because hopefully you've cared about this all the while, and hopefully you're voting so that these issues are handled, all of these issues are handled accordingly. As always, keep bearing the lightness of being. I love you all, and until next time. I've got AC.